we can get started. I'd like to call this meeting a special board of selectmen meeting to order to receive proposals on development of the former Country Club of Woodbridge property. It's just now 7 p.m. and I have some opening remarks. I'm glad to see the turnout tonight. Thank you for taking the time to join us and learn more about these proposals. Since I began my term in office as first selectman in July of 2017, among my top priorities has been to work diligently, together with my fellow members of the Board of Selectmen, to explore and bring to the residents of Woodbridge a viable plan for the future of the former Country Club property. As you know, this approximately 150-acre parcel was purchased by the town in 2009 and has been the focus of considerable efforts over the years to determine the best path, best path forward. I authorized a public opinion survey in January, February of 2018 to ask residents to provide their thoughts. Our town finance director tells me the current cost to carry this property is approximately a half a million dollars a year. That includes debt service and costs to maintain the property. With this background in mind, the Board of Selectmen has been considering proposals for the best use of the property. And at a special Board of Selectmen meeting on November 28th, the Board heard presentations and asked questions of the two developers who are interested in purchasing a parcel, portion of the parcel, about one-third of the total acreage for development of age-restricted housing for people over age 55. These previous presentations and a video recording of the meeting are available on the town website for review. We will also post tonight's meeting materials and video as soon as they are available, and we will send this out by email. Please sign up on one of the clipboards here tonight if you are not yet receiving these emails. At the Board of Selectmen's regular meeting December 11th, we continued our discussion regarding the negotiations of these proposals. Tonight's meeting will feature two updated presentations regarding the former Country Club property, as well as an opportunity for public comment and questions to the developer. We are holding this public information session to inform residents of the proposals and hear your questions and comments. The meeting will be recorded and then available, as I said, for anyone who is not able to attend. And again, I invite residents to review all the information share their views with me and the selectmen as we continue to look at these options. Because we are still in the process of determining the final details to be negotiated, the Board of Selectmen will not vote tonight. And in fact, we are not able to amend tonight's agenda in any way because of the rules that apply to the special meeting. It is clear that among townspeople, there are differences in opinions about what would be best for the future of this parcel. Ultimately, this will go to a townwide vote should the selectmen feel we have a proposal that should go to referendum. That is our responsibility as a board, and then it will be up to the voters. Again, we would like your input and to hear what questions you may have. So turning now to our agenda, item number two, we will have the two presentations, and I will ask everyone to please hold your comments until both presentations are completed. We will then move to item three for public comments and ask any questions you may have for the developers. With that in mind, let me first introduce Robert Sachs. And Robert, will you please introduce all members of your team? Good evening. I'm Robert Sachs. We, we are, we're a local developer in Brantford in the Connecticut area. With us tonight is Mike Ott from Summer Hill Engineering. Carl Porto from the Porto Group, and my brother Greg Sachs, who's also a resident of Woodbridge. A couple weeks ago, we started with a proposal of about 125 units out of one third of the Woodbridge Country Club. We went back and forth on a few different locations on the development. We really thought this was the best location. Right now, we're certainly in the preliminary stage where it is, what type of house is it, and the actual elevations of, of the houses, but without further ado, I want to let Carl start with the presentation and let you guys have some questions. Good evening, Robert said. My name is Carl Porto. I practice in Hamden, and I'm pleased to present to you guys uh, this evening an updated version of the presentation we provided to the Board of Selectmen, which if anybody saw online, 
And as Robert indicated, uh, outlines what we envision for what we formerly called the Woodbridge Estates project. If you, I'm going to twist here a little bit. If you uh, turn your attention to the slide here, this represents the club property in general. It's not the entire Woodbridge Country Club, but this is the bulk of it. Our project is going to comprise about 55 acres um, with about 125 units situated largely uh, along one of the main fairways. And it's a little hard to see on the, the slide. Uh, there's some natural buffering that's going to remain in place as, it, as where it currently exists with some trees. And our clubhouse will be located here in the corner. We propose to build 125 units of age-restricted uh, housing. And this will be very similar to the project that Mr. Sachs has in Orange called Fieldstone Village that some of you may have seen or be, uh, or be uh, aware of. Uh, that project is 142 units on about 10 or less acres, um, but represents a very similar product in terms of function, style, form, finish, and quality that we expect here. I'm just going to run through a couple of slides that are represented above our Fieldstone project. This is our entranceway. Another view of the entranceway, you'll notice lots of plantings, stonework. This is the, again, the main entrance, two lanes in and out. We envision, you know, topographic conditions allowing, obviously, similar, uh, similar main entrance here. This is uh, our clubhouse. This is another view of the putting green. This is obviously the pool taken from the rear of the clubhouse. You'll notice the stonework, interesting roof lines. This is an average streetscape. It shows the different uh, style and types of houses. This is a, a frontal view, obviously. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to make note of, uh, this project is on slightly more land. These homes enjoy about a 10-foot side area setback. We're going to be doubling that here. So if anybody's been to the Fieldstone project and it seems a little crowded, we're actually putting about 20 less units on about 15 more acres. So we expect uh, the green space to be a little bit more generous, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but there'll be more room uh, between the individual units. This is obviously a, obviously a two-car garage version. This one has a front porch on it, which is a popular style. This is an interior view of one of our average homes. Granite, nicely done ceilings, and uh, interesting architectural features, uh, the mantle with the fireplace. This is obviously a large cathedral ceiling type of arrangement. Hardwood floors. And then, for purposes of online, there's some representative um, floor plans. Drawing back quickly to the project in general, uh, we anticipate a wide range of homes as we have the Fieldstone. The homes will probably start in the low fours. They're largely customizable and they could rise considerably above that, but there'll be a wide range of types and styles depending on what somebody would want or need. Our uh, clubhouse will be very similar as, as a field stone. There'll be a pool, there'll be other amenities, weight rooms. And as part of uh, our proposal, as was indicated in the last presentation, we'll be demolishing the clubhouse, uh, the current clubhouse at the uh, Country Club, as well as installing a brand new pool and in a changing uh, room facility, which will be on town property, but will be done at the developer's expense. As a, most people are probably aware, condominium projects, particularly age-restricted ones such as this, are enormously low consumers of town resources. There's no children to, to educate, there's no buses that have to come up there. We plow our own snow. Um, it's a really a self-contained community, so there's not a lot of draw and burden on the town. On the other hand, these will be Modest, modest to um, rather luxurious homes. We anticipate a annual tax benefit to the town in excess of $2 million and probably a permit fees in the neighborhood of a $1 million just to build the units themselves. You'll notice from this layout, and I'm going to have Mr. Ott speak to it a little bit more specifically, but this is a, we feel, is a superior layout in terms of how the project should be built. It provides for some generous green space on both the front part of the project here, as well as an interior section, uh, as well as uh, an area over here, which Mr. Ott will talk about why that is important. Uh, it also allows for some interconnection. Uh, we anticipate of some of the car paths and internal walking paths that are there now. We're going to try and rehabilitate and restore those and they connect those to some 
uh, within the remaining club facility, which we will not be acquiring. We think this is a superior layout. It works well. It provides for very low well impact in terms of site work. Uh, the bulk of the project runs right down to one of the existing fairways, which is obviously relatively flat. We expect to be able to build it with minimal uh, earthwork and construction activity. We also believe it will provide for convenient access to the homes in terms of minimal steps, because the project will be larger on one level. There is some uh, height to it here at the bend, but it rises naturally, and we don't anticipate any large construction problems or cutting and filling. That, that is a summarization of our project. Uh, we invite uh, the residents, uh, as well as the Board of Selectmen, to come by the Fieldstone project. Uh, the benefit that Mr. Sachs uh, brings to this application, as well as the entire team of developers, including professional staff, including my law firm, is we are on the tail end of uh, delivering those 142 units. Um, we have a lot of experience in developing the, the plan, getting it zoned, actually building it, doing the earthwork, setting up the model, and getting the, the homes actually built and delivered, which uh, is quite a task. Uh, but we've got a team that knows what they're doing, how to do it. It's worked very smoothly. My firm has represented all uh, the developer in all the sales, so we have a lot of experience in how to deliver these. We expect an absorption rate of about 25 units per year. We see this as about a five-year project. Our experience tells us that that should work uh, about, about what should work here. <laughs> Economy issues depending, but that's we think is a reasonable uh, estimate. I'm going to turn over to Mr. Rogers to talk briefly about some of the site uh, information. I believe at the end of uh, the other applicant's proposal, we'll be hearing some questions. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Ott. I'm a, a professional engineer with Summer Hill Civil Engineers in Madison. Um, Attorney Porto has um, really covered pretty much everything I was going to say. I'll, I'll give you a little bit about uh, uh, the, the kind of boring engineering stuff about why we think uh, this is the, the best location for the project. Um, it may be difficult to see, but there is a green, so I can do this with the, the pointer, there's a, there we go, there's a green asterisk right there on Ansonia Road. That's the location, the approximate location of um, where the sanitary sewer is that, that flows uh, to the west down to a pump station um, near Race uh, Brook. Uh, that, that is where the development sanitary sewer connection would be made. Um, I, should, I should back up a minute. We, um, because of the, this is in the proposal stage, obviously, we haven't done any real engineering or any design work, but we've walked the site several times and we've looked at um, available information, published public information for the site, including utilities. So um, we think we think that this this portion of the site and the way it's laid out um, makes sense for the impact on the site. Um, the 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 road network is laid out such that it follows the land, so that the earthwork, the the excavation and the filling, is minimized. Um, so that we don't have to blast, so that we have, because this is an age will be an age restricted development, um, so that homes will be um, at, at very close elevations equally on both sides of the roads, so we don't have a lot of steps for people to deal with. Um, and uh, the, the blue asterisk on the site, uh, another right there, is another. Um, boring engineering thing, but we need, we need to deal with stormwater management. Um, the development will generate stormwater runoff, and when we go, uh, if the project were to move forward and we went through the regulatory uh, review and, and approval process, including the town's land use commissions, we're going to have to have a plan for stormwater management and then walking the site. Again, um, the way this is laid out, it, it works well with the topography, and, and there's a, a, an appropriate area to handle the stormwater management from the site to protect the watercourse that flows through the site and the adjacent uh, 
well and resources and pond downstream. Um, I think that's that's the kind of a summary of the, uh, the engineering issues. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Brian St. Pierre. And Brian, if you would kindly introduce your team as well, please. St. Pierre. I am the owner of Insight Development Group uh, based here in Woodbridge, Connecticut. I also live here uh, with my uh, wife and three kids. And the kids, uh, they're in feature school and the last one's going soon. So uh, we're, we're fully involved in the town here. Uh, with, with me today is Phil DeGenero, who is the uh, head of sound development, who's our partner in the deal. Phil, um, I can have him introduce himself, um, but Basically, he's a, a developer as, as myself uh, here in the New York uh, Tri-State area. Uh, he's based out of Trumbull and has done several projects uh, similar to this in, in the state of Connecticut and uh, also commercial projects uh, to go with it. Um, Bill, you want to introduce yourself or you want to just... <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so let's get into this, um, the presentation here. So our proposal, our proposal is, is basically uh, similar to the, the other um, proposal you heard here today, but we are calling ours the Wood, Wood, uh, the Wood Valley Estates, and as everybody knows, this is the current property, uh, Woodbridge uh, Country Club property as it sits now, and to date, I, I believe it's completely abandoned at this point. Uh, we as a town have voted not to open up the pool next year. So this is a, a, a completely abandoned town, or abandoned property at this point. And as a Woodbridge resident, I'd love to see something happen with it, regardless of, of what, uh, what we decide as a, as a town. So Woodbridge is, is, is a very, um, I call it an elderly town. Uh, we are roughly 55% of, of the population is over the age of 55. And that leads to some concerns about, you know, residents moving in and out of, out of the town. We're getting to a point where, you know, I, I know we're concerned about school systems and, and the amount of new families coming in. We'd like to retain as much as of the over 55 population as we can, and we believe that this small 55 and older community is a, is a good way to, to solve that solution. So our proposal is, is very similar to Mr. Sachs's proposal. Um, we are proposing roughly uh, the purchase of 60, 55 to 60 acres, and we'll be doing approximately 100 um, 55 and older uh, homes, single family, detached. And within that uh, proposal, we are, there will obviously be a, a, a clubhouse for the residents of the community that will house a, um, a, a meeting center, a pool, and tennis courts, pickleball courts, uh, similar to what you see in, in 55 and older communities around the country. In addition, we'll also be improving uh, and renovating the existing pool and, and opening it up back to the public. Uh, similar to the same situation that we have with the town now as far as a, a small membership fee um, for the use of, for, by uh, Woodbridge residents. With that, we will also be demolishing the existing clubhouse. Um, I walked through it again about two months ago ap after not being in it for two years or so, and it's, um, it, it needs to be tear torn down. I mean, there, there's really no salving it up or saving it. Um, I consider it totaled at this point. It's it's cheaper for me to, for probably myself and, and Mr. Sachs to build a new one than it would be to, to renovate that one. So with that, we'll be taking down the, the existing uh, clubhouse and in this place putting back a, a new pool house uh, with locker rooms, showers, um, and obviously a snack bar for, for the, uh, 
the pool goers. And in addition, the rest of the remaining property will be held by the town of Woodbridge, roughly 100 acres um, for public park. And it's our proposal um, that we will assist the town in some of the renovations that are needed to make that an open town park. Uh, I know the, the, the existing car paths for the, for the golf course need to be redone. We were more than willing to help with, with the renovation of those. So there's, there's benefits that we'll be giving back to the town as far as, as um, improvements to the town park that we would all, you know, our open space and walking trails, however we want to, um, however we want to say it, but we will be helping the town to, to do that. And as I mentioned, you know, walking paths throughout, not only the community, but throughout the, the park area also. Our proposal is, is slightly different than, than Mr. Sachs. Um, our, our, we, we focused ours on the, on the east side of the property, uh, basically along Woodfield Road. If, if you're familiar with the property, this is the existing uh, clubhouse and pool, as you can see. These are the existing tennis courts um, that are there now, and the, the cell tower is, is roughly back in here somewhere. So we believe this is the this is the best, <laughs> obviously as as they do. Um, this is the best position for for the uh, community. One, it's it, it allows the town to retain what I consider the most valuable piece of the of the property. It's the flattest. It's the it has the large pond. It, it would be a beautiful park setting. Our our area is what I would consider the. the like the least desired piece of the property. There's a lot of, lot of ledge behind uh, along Woodfield Road, and the, if, you, if you know the property well, this is kind of the ridge line that goes, you know, from Ansonia Road up. So all, all of these homes will be to the east or, or over the top of the, the existing ridge line. So the only real visible space that you would see the homes from is, is Ansonia Road, uh, kind of in this area. You'll, I, I imagine you'd see some of these um, homes here in the, in the front, and then obviously along Woodfield, you would see the clubhouse and the, uh, you know, this would be the main entrance and the clubhouse and the, and the homes that are in that area. Reason reason we did that is is not only for visibility, but as I mentioned, I, I believe that this is the most valuable piece of the Woodbridge property uh, as it sits now. In addition, it also keeps it away from all the residents that line these three sides of the of the property. I, I believe there's only maybe one, I think there's one house in the corner here, and then. You know the rest are, are start from the, the pool and, and head around. As with Mr. Sachs' proposal, we these will all be single-family homes, uh, luxury homes, and consistent with the 55 and older community. Uh, they will all be uh, single-level homes with the option of a second, a, you know, second floor or a loft for uh, as an add-on, you know, to uh, to the home. With my, I'm, I'm an architect by trade, and for me, the style, keeping with the style of, of Woodbridge is first and foremost, not only that, you know, not only being a resident of Woodbridge, I'm, it, it's near and dear to my heart to keep it as, as close to the style of, of, of Woodbridge as we possibly can. And obviously, it, um, first, these homes will have first floor master bedrooms, and, you know, maintenance-free lawns, driveways, streets, uh, similar to Mr. Sachs's, uh, through an HOA system, which is, is common in, in these communities. This is an example of what the community center for the actual residents of uh, the, the 55 year old community would look like. Uh, it would be uh, equipped with uh, uh, age-specific uh, fitness center, the, the tennis and pickleball courts in the existing area that it is now, as we mentioned, and then a meeting space, um, you know, card table rooms, that, that sort of thing for the residents of, of the community itself. 
This is an example of, of what we would be doing for a pool house. As I mentioned, we'd be taking down the existing uh, clubhouse and in this place putting back a small um, pool house uh, just, just for the pool open to the town uh, of Woodbridge. Um, equipped with changing room, you know, changing rooms and lockers and, and showers and things like that for typically what you would see in a pool house. So what does it all boil down to? It, it all boils down to um, we'd be relieving the, the town of, of nearly uh, $4.4 million of, of the current debt that it has on the property at, as, as it sits now. Based on the current mill rate, uh, the community would generate about $1.6, $1.7 million in, in new taxes. Uh, there was a, there's an approximately about a half a million, maybe a little bit more, um, in related building permits and fees for, for the construction of this. Um, we would demo the, the, you know, the condemned or abandoned clubhouse at our expense. And then lastly, it satisfies the need for the aging population here in Woodbridge. Uh, it's a 55 year old community, no impact on the school system, as we said, no impact on, on our DOT. Um, and it would be run by a, an HOA system. As a resident of Woodbridge, I want to know what the benefits are for me <laughs> also. Um, so the, the, the resident benefits are one, obviously the renovated pool and, and pool house, it's closed as of now. So we would, we'd be reopening that, that up to the public and, and giving that as an amenity uh, for the property. The, uh, sorry that's a typo, but uh, 100 plus acres of, of public park and walking trails uh, equipped with fishing, you know, there's the big pond at the, at the bottom that maybe we can make a fishing pond. A picnic area, maybe a small little pavilion where we can have, you know, picnic tables and, and things like that. But just an overall park setting um, that, that the town can use as a whole. In addition, it's going to, I know, no, not decrease taxes, but it, it will most likely stabilize taxes. Um, with, with removing the, the debt on the, on the property and some of the um, maintenance costs that, were, that are associated with it, it should stabilize uh, taxes and provide funds because there will be roughly in excess of a of million dollars you know, from the purchase to um, what we owe on the, on the property for the much needed capital, uh, capital improvement projects that literally just came out. I, I saw them in the newspaper here today. I, I got them in the mail. Um, which is about $5.5 million that, that the town is needing for this, for new capital improvements. So it goes a long way in helping, you know, to get those projects done that, that we need. And lastly, and, and one of my, my big concerns is improving the property uh, conditions. It, as the property sits now, it, it pains me to drive by it. I was a, a, a frequent golfer at, at Woodbridge Country Club. My brother was actually the uh, assistant pro there. Uh, for a number of years, and I grew up playing that golf course, and it pains me to, to see the way it looks as, as it does right now. Um, so this project, and along with the, the coordination with uh, the town on, on the, the, um, the public park setting, um, it would drastically improve the, the look of the property and, and bring it to the beauty that it should be. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it up to the board. Um, but I'm here for any questions and, and happy to answer any of them. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item three on the agenda is public comments. Before we begin item three, I would just like to remind everyone that we, the board, have all, have all the correspondence here, including every item that was received today in our packet as prints out. So there's no need to read letters if you choose not to into the record if you've mailed them or email them to us already. I would like to ask that everyone try to keep their statements to our usual two-minute time, time limit tonight out of respect for everyone who would like to speak. Of course, if you have questions, you may ask them, and the developers may, be, may take the time to answer. Please step up to the microphone and sign in on the clipboard so we have the correct spelling of your name and your address for the record. Lastly, please, let's all try to remain civil and neighborly Woodbridge is a wonderful small town, and we are all genuinely interested in hearing the details of what is being considered, as well as our neighbors' questions, opinions. We may not always agree, but we can always be agreeable, even in disagreement. Thank you, everyone, for keeping these ground goals in mind. And with that, 
Step up and talk. Okay, basically, Alan Davis and 15 Edgefield Drive. Woodbridge have been here uh, since 1971, and I wish we had two golf courses, one for each developer. These projects sound wonderful. My question is bankruptcy. Both of you have proposed excellent solutions. I was at Hilton Head when everything went bankrupt there, and all these developments were sitting in the woods with half-built houses, nobody getting in control of them. And this is important here. We are talking a huge amount of land with 125 houses. How many houses do you have to sell in order to make the uh, communities self-sufficient? What happens if you can't sell those houses? Do you have the initial uh, backing to sustain that this doesn't get thrown back into the town? This is key. The last thing this town needs is another development that's half done, another um, community house that's falling down instead of community house slum development. Because if these houses aren't purchased, they're slums. And the next thing you know, it's a disaster. Uh, there are many other questions. How do you get the bonding to make sure that the town is not responsible and that the town gets this property back intact if you cannot sustain it? And I don't know, Jerry probably can think of a thousand other questions, but I don't think that way. Thank you. Alan, did you want both of the developers to respond to that? I think so. Okay. I think this is key to the, uh, okay. what do you pick? Do you pick Thank A you. or B? Thank you. So for the record, Phil Legionnaire was on development. Um, that's a great question. Um, when we look at a project, um, we want it, as bad as anybody, probably you, for it to be financially viable. We're not going to invest in something that doesn't make economic sense. Um, we would not undertake this project unless we had the capital to do it, which requires a, a large equity component and funding from banks. Uh, at our company, we've been developing for 35 years. We've never not completed a project. We've never gone bankrupt. Uh, we have a 100% track record. Over the last, I would say, 60 months, we've probably completed about $180 million in projects. And we just, I mean, economics are as important as any other facet to the project, so. Good evening. Uh, you are exactly right. That is probably the most, the number one question for all you guys. And for us as well, because we wouldn't be here if we didn't think it was a larger project. Or certainly start the project without it. You need capital funding to start, you need bank financing to start. And one of the things that we did at Fieldstone to make sure that we weren't in that situation is we didn't build 142 homes. We built two or three models and we built homes on a contract base. That's, that's the way our bank wanted and it really was the smartest thing to do. So if you phase out the project, God forbid the world ends like it did in 2009, you can stop it or slow the project and build it as the economy builds back up again. Good evening. My name is Jeff Ginsburg. I am the Town of Woodbridge representative to the GNH WPCA, which is the Greater New Haven Water Pollution Control Authority. Um, at the GNH, uh, we have acquired the, the assets, the, uh, the sewer system of Woodbridge. And I am certain that our entity would like to know what possible impact there would be on the town of Woodbridge's sewer system. So uh, I'm introducing myself to you tonight, and I hope that you will contact the GNH. Um, you can get my uh, address, telephone number information, and you can contact me at any time so that I can bring relevant information to the GNH at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is David Jensen. Uh, I've been a 14 year resident of Woodbridge. I have two children that graduated from Matthew High School, and I am age 50, over age 55. Um, I have one observation and three concerns that you can comment on as you like. My observation is that this land use direction, although we have two very strong proposals in front of us, the general direction of the land use is contrary to what has been uh, voiced by the town of Woodbridge on repeated occasions. My concerns are age 55 and over housing is enforced only by the homeowners association of the community. It is not enforceable by the town, the state, or any other um, legal government uh, entity. Also, the zoning required to introduce this housing has not been proven to be uh, not a precedent to allow the same type of development in other areas in the town, which I think is you know, largely a concern of many people. And um, third, the town has a large tract of land allocated <coughs> to the development of over 55 houses. It's sat, it's sat idle for a number of years now with no activity, and I don't see where the incentive is to allocate more land to a purpose that has not been attracted to the developers uh, in control of that property today. Uh, ask you a question regarding enforcement. You were right. Age-restricted uh, age projects are a creature of federal statute. As most people are aware, you cannot discriminate on age or various other uh, reasons unless permitted by law. Uh, federal government does allow restricted um, age-restricted projects for people over 55, and that enforcement comes through the Homeowners Association, which is then really in turn um, driven by compliance with the statute by the people who live there in order to make sure that their mortgages um, qualify and that the project stays viable. Lenders won't lend in a project that's not in compliance with the statute. So anybody who's got a mortgage on a property, if he wants to sell a unit that needs that the buyer needs a mortgage on, is going to be very, very constrained if the, the uh, uh, compliance is not there. It is not particularly burdensome. Uh, I'm in the process uh, with Mr. Sachs and the team of working on another project where we've extensively gone through this with another planning and zoning commission. We've written into those uh, zoning regulations some of the statutory requirements. It's a yearly consensus. It is not a Herculean task. It is important, and we have not found uh, through our history developing both the Fieldstone and the various other projects it to be a problem. Um, as to the issue of zoning, um, we are a little bit new to the town in terms of uh, some of the issues that I know you guys have been facing. We will certainly work with the town council and the various planning and zoning authorities to make sure it is appropriately zoned. Uh, we understand that there's a possibility for zoning uh, for other large tracts for congregate housing that may not be as appealing. We think this project has some unique characteristics that will allow uh, the zoning regulations to be crafted in such a manner that it won't be simply widespread spread uh, zoning of similar projects. Every project of this uh, scale has been had to go through planning and zoning, probably is going to have to go through wetlands. Uh, so the town, it's not just a free wheel. Just because we do it here doesn't mean everyone's just going to get it everywhere else in town. Uh, these will be, these are large scale, complex projects. They require a fair amount of capital input in the pre-planning stage, uh, as was indicated. Um, by a film, there's a lot of commitment up front. Part of that is the due diligence just to figure out where to put the houses. How are they going to fit on the site? How are we going to manage storm water? All that needs to be taken into account. So just saying you've got 50 or 60, 100 acres and we're going to throw a housing project or any other project on it is not really an accurate statement. Every project is unique. Every project has to go through all the planning, due diligence, and zoning requirements. And only after the town commissions approve it can we go and build it. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the 50, regulating the 55 uh, and older in the actual community to, to the lawyer. But um, in terms of zoning, uh, you are correct. This, this would be a, what, what we consider an overlay zone uh, in, the, in the residential district or the residential uh, zone that the, the property currently is. And over, I've been working on this project for roughly two years. Starting with the, the last administration and now and now with uh, with Beth and her administration, 
And we've done extensive research, uh, talking with zoning lawyers and, and other towns who have who've come across this. And this particular property is, is so unique, and the regulations that you can put onto this property would virtually eliminate every single other piece of property uh, in the town of Woodbridge. And you do that with things such as access to a state road. In other words, if you're going to do this 55 and older community, it has to have access to a state road. That eliminates a lot of properties here in Woodbridge. Then you take it a step further. It has to have certain utilities, public, public water and public, um, and public sewer, which, as we all know, here in Woodbridge, 95% of the town is on well and, and, and um, septic. So that eliminates another you know, group of, of properties that might be eligible for, for this overlay. We could take it even further. In other words, this 55 and older community needs to be on at least 50 acres. Well, that, that leaves it to about a handful of, of properties in, in, in Woodbridge that are 55 or 50 acres or more. Take it a step further. You know, we, we can regulate it in a way that it needs to adjoin at least 100 acres of town-owned property, which at that point shuts down every single other uh, piece of property in the town of Woodbridge because I don't believe we have any other property that's over 100 acres besides this, this community, or this uh, property that, that, that we have now. So, again, as Carl said, we're, we're going to need to go through planning and zoning. You know, the sale of this land is contingent on, on gaining these zoning approvals. So the town is the town people are going to have their opportunity again to come in front of them and, and express their concerns. But I, from my experience, from from what I've uh, researched over the past two years, the restrictions on this on this property um, are so unique that it virtually eliminates every other uh, property here in Woodbridge. If I can just add to, uh, to that comment, uh, the, the, the question about the enforceability of age-restricted housing is a good one, uh, and it would be, this proposal is unique because the town is the seller of the property, so the town controls what kind of conditions the sale will, will contemplate. One of those conditions will, in the deed, will specifically say this property is to be used for nothing other than 55 and over, over housing, which the town can enforce on its own if it is ever violated. So there's a little more of a built-in protection for the town. There's a significant built-in protection for the town to make sure it remains as 55 and over housing, as well as any zoning, if it is uh, approved, will specifically say this can only be used for 55 and over housing, which means it, if, it, if it is not, it's a zoning violation. So there are many, several town protections to make sure that this property stays as 55 and older housing. I know of no situation in, in the state of Connecticut, at least, maybe some people do, where 55 and old, older housing was overturned after a period of time by anyone. So that's, uh, and I think we can uh, build in some uh, significant safeguards in the deed. Thank you.
when asked how long that might take, the developers have acknowledged that it could take five to eight years. That's a minimum. That's not taking into account any potential slowdown in our economy, which is already being predicted for 2020. I believe the year, correct me if I'm wrong, that Fieldstone started construction, which I believe is 2008. Only two houses were sold. If you think the country club property looks unkempt now, how would you feel about looking at mounds of dirt for an extended period of time? One developer has proposed a park on the undeveloped property. Who's going to clean up the property, create this park, and who's going to maintain it? I know you mentioned that you would work with us, but that really doesn't say too much. Um, if you are thinking you might be interested in relocating to one of these communities, should they be built in Woodbridge, please make sure to ask the what the price point will be. I'm certain you will be surprised. Most folks will be paying more to move into a restricted community than you will be receiving for your present home. There will, be, there will have to be zoning changes for any development to occur on this parcel. Once that is approved, I believe it will be easier for the town to then continue to sell off portions of or the remaining property for additional development. Not once has the town submitted a complete plan for what they are envisioning for the entire golf course property. We have been told that this is an attempt to pay off our debt and balance our budget. Perhaps the town should once again be looking at different avenues to increase revenue without increasing our taxes. Some of the possibilities to increase revenue have been discussed previously at board selecting this meeting, yet to my knowledge, nothing has been done to act upon them. The town bought the property in 2009 as a way of avoiding development. Residents voted down a toll brother proposal in 2011. I believe there was yet another proposal in 2016 that was withdrawn before being presented to residents because the administration knew it would be defeated. What else needs to be done to show the administration that development is not what the majority of residents want? Many, many trails 
our Woodbridge Land Trust, a substantial property and very effective, and so that we can maintain the rural aspect of this town. <coughs> to have this entire golf course, 100 acres of the park, uh, I think is ridiculous in terms of the economic realities of running the town. And so I, I will just start by asking you, or conclude by asking you, to tell us about your A55 decisions. If part of your decision went into additional school children, I would like to know what demographic studies you have done to determine that there are not sufficient empty seats or however many seats would be required if this was not A55 restricted. Thank you. Somewhat twofold. One is we, we feel there's a need for, for 55 and older uh, housing within the, the town of Woodbridge. Um, we, as as my slide showed, you know, 55 percent of the of the population is is over the age of 45, and I believe that was a 2016 study. So as as you can imagine, there's there's more now. The main factor was obviously the the impact of the school system. Um, we. If you, I, I just caught up today on it, but in, in the newspaper today, um, we're projecting, I guess, in, in, at Beecher Road School, that there's going to be a shortage. There's going to be a shortage and a um, and a need for, for more classroom space coming uh, due to the um, projections that they have for the next five years. Uh, that that's part of our, our capital projects that we're looking at and increasing. So. Again, part of keeping kids out of the school system uh, was was uh, that, and I forgot the second part of the question. Why not build 200 or more houses? Oh, why not build 200? Um, again, you know, I'm, it, as a Woodbridge resident, obviously, I I would love. I, I'm a developer. I, I would love to put as many houses on this piece of property myself. I mean, that's. Uh, but that I, that I do not know yet. I know the projections that uh, we had for when we wanted to make the whole thing open space was roughly a half a million dollars a year uh, to maintain the whole property. I did leave that, those, uh, no? Uh, okay, I, I, I apologize, I, I, I'll let the board speak on that, but it was, it was a, sub, a substantial number, uh, one, to turn it into open space, as I remember, and also to to maintain the open space. So that was, that was, and I apologize, I don't have the numbers here in front of me, but, um, and, and obviously why would we not do it on, on the whole property? Um, it, it, it's, it's strictly to, to satisfy the need, or the, not the need, the, the request of the townspeople to, to have an open space on this project, or on this property. Uh, we tried to fit it as, as well as we could, and, and both our proposals are only taking a third of what the actual piece um, is of the, of the whole property. So. Uh, I echo what, what Brian said. There's a number of reasons, logistics, um, overall use of the site, uh, how much do we absorb. Sure, we could take 75 acres and build another 30 or 40 units, and for developers, more is generally better, uh, but we think this is the right size for the project at the time it's the least impact on the town being the age 55. Uh, so we think overall, we understand that there's been mixed reviews as was evident when the uh, applause for the uh, individual said they didn't want any development. So this is a proposal that we hope satisfies everybody and maybe doesn't satisfy anybody, which is usually that sort of happy medium. So it, it's a fluid situation, we could do more. Uh, we'd be happy to do a few more. I don't know if we have an appetite for the entire project. You do end up with absorption rate issues, uh, but this seems to be the right amount of units at the right time and the right amount of space on the project. Good evening. My name is Adrienne Bowman. I'm the Chief Smith. I live at 17 and Sumner Road in Woodbridge. Apparently, one's perspective is partly, partly depends on where one lives because the previous speaker lived at Chestnut Lake, which is nowhere near the golf course. My house 
My name is Adrian Michi Smith. I live at 17 in Sonia Road, right across the street from where Mr. Porto's um, driveway is going to be. And it seems like um, the perspective is partly determined how where people live because the previous speaker lives at Chestnut Lane, which is nowhere near. But in any way, in any event, I have been a long-time local uh, opponent of development of the golf course, as most of you know here. Um, part of the reason I feel this way is emotional. Um, my parents, I grew up in Derby on the hill. My parents uh, and some of their neighbors fought Harold Yepkin when he developed, from, because he wanted to develop a um, uh, look, shopping plaza down um, where, um, not Home Depot, but the other one. Lowe's currently is, obviously they lost. Across the street where the edge is now, used to be Charlie's Pond where we used to go skating. And then I was very sad when Heinz sold, I think it was Heinz, sold beer property in Fieldstone Village. And I've been very, very unhappy with the way that's been looking. Um, but from a less personal point of view, so I, obviously I'm not happy about any of this. From a less personal point of view though, um, I'm finally glad to hear people finally talking about the zoning. I have been to see Beth and Tony. My husband, who's an attorney, has written to Beth and Tony about the um, uh, zoning, has had a couple of conversations with uh, Councilor Weiner. And my understanding, I am not an attorney, is that there is no way that this property is so unusual that, that it can't be, uh, the zone, it won't make zoning easier elsewhere. Um, in terms of public water, there are public water lines all up and down the main roads in Woodbridge, and, and it, just because it doesn't exist on property now, it may exist in the future. Um, and the same with other things. I really think this zoning is a Pandora's box, and um, we need to really think long and hard before we change any, any of the zoning. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Maria Kane. I'm from 1891 Litchfield Turnpike. I thank the uh, Board of Selectmen for um, giving us all the time to understand your proposals. I think this is the third time I've heard this proposal. And, but I want to tell you something. Uh, there is, I look at these things and I listen to the discussions. Um, first of all, it's only tonight that they were talking about zoning. But second of all, there's nothing new about this proposal. We're having the same discussions. There is no vision for the town. It's the same old thing. And we have turned this down, not once, but twice in referendum. So even today, while we've been stricted by a lot of fiscal expenses, uh, including a new one from the Beecher Road School, why are we setting this thing up for referendum again? Same thing, same old thing, same old discussion. Okay. Um, I want to remind you about a study I submitted to the BOS back in 2015. I was a member of the Woodbridge Conservation Commission for nearly 20 years and a member of the BOS. I strongly promoted the idea of acquiring and preserving open space. If nothing else, I would prefer <coughs> preserving open space than this proposal tonight. In these proposals tonight. The study was done by a New York government finance expert and not an environmentalist. Uh, to summarize the report's relevant findings, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> number one, open space costs towns less than residential lands. Open space demands fewer municipal services than land use in other than lands in other use. In comparison, lands in the residential use typically consume services of greater value than the property tax revenues generated by these lands. Second, open space helps control tax increases. Open space preservation can actually help keep taxes lower. Conversely, the loss of open space can increase per capita tax rates in a community. Third, open space protects home values. Open space preservation can contribute to increase land values due to the aesthetic, recreational, and other potential values of open space. Property values of adjacent lands often increase. Open space preservation is better than long-term uh, health 
for the long-term health of our municipalities. Decision-making that explicitly considers and values the positive economic effects of open space will best serve a community's long-term interests. Again, Woodbridge is, a, is unique as the only town in Connecticut that borders a major city, but feels like a rural community. This unique character and the high property values that have always accompanied it are a direct result of a long-standing, far-sighted zoning regulations. These proposals triple the residential density allowed by zoning. Uh, sorry. Um, allowed by zoning regulations. If zoning is changed to accommodate these proposals, we risk that such a change could spread to large parcels of land in the town. Open space is a, oh, I know, in the zoning discussion, Mr. Weiner said that it doesn't necessarily, necessarily need to do that, but he offers. I have not heard any guarantees that would protect our zoning regulations. Open space is a precious finite natural resource that supports the values of our properties. Okay. It is central to the quality of life in our town. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much. I do want to remind everyone that there was only one referendum on this property so far. Not two. It was voted down. Um, my name is Dan Cowan. I live on Whitwood Drive. Um, I've only been a resident here for five years, so much different than everybody else, and I'm well under 55. But one thing I've noticed for the five years I've lived here is every <coughs> summer, yellow balloons go up and for sale signs follow them. So people move out of the community, and the houses get renovated and rejuvenated, and new young families move in. And it, we have a density in this town right now, about you know, 1.7 acres per house. And I did some back of the math, and if we develop the whole 100 acres in 1.7 lots and sell them for, you know, a million dollar plus houses, we could still generate that $2 million. And you could privatize it, and you keep the same homey feel that you would like in the community. Also, we keep saying that there's no impact to the school if we have this 150, 125 houses come in. But I assume the 125 residents of these new houses will be current Woodbridge residents, not out of the town. So that would be 125 houses that go on the city line. Is everybody that lives here? You know, but that those houses that are current Woodbridge residents that choose to move from this house to that house will go vacant and a new family will move in. So maybe not all 125 of them will represent new families in the school, but a large percentage of them probably will. And those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, Lane Brassman. Can everybody hear me? Well, no, Elaine. Uh, try again. Lane Brassman on Brookwood Drive, right here at the Country Club. So I guess what I want to say to everybody here is that life changes, needs change. I've been in Woodbridge for over 35 years. When we moved here, it was a young community, very vibrant, pretty low taxes, or you know, pretty much in line. Now we're an older community with very high taxes, uh, very few services, and we have an abandoned property sitting right at the foot of our town. Well, it seems only really common sense the town made a blue dockle decision of a state years ago and bought it, and now we have to correct that mistake. Those of you who say that our house, you know, that Woodbridge, that the houses are selling, if houses sell in Woodbridge, all of you know that our houses are selling at a reduced price because of our taxes. Hopefully, hopefully, one of these two communities will be built, and hopefully our prices, our taxes will be stabilized. I've never seen taxes go down. Hopefully they won't go up for this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Newman. I live at Road in Woodbridge. I've lived here since 1995. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need any of this discussion. We could have all the open space we want. But that's not the reality of Woodbridge. We've had a town that has spent money like crazy. New library, new firehouse, public works garage, 
schools. Now a new $5 million upgrade to the police station. And on it goes. My question is, how many in the town of Woodbridge are even aware of how much debt we're in? I would say a very small percentage. Let me give you some facts. So in 2016, I wrote the first selectman help. She was kind enough to write that. Here's what we owe. Over $20 million in long-term debt, over $9 million in short-term debt, and this doesn't include our portion of the MB debt. What about unfunded liability? We owe the cops, the pensions, as well as, I guess, anybody else who works for the town. Guess how much that is? Another $5 million a year is not in the bank. So let's put it in now, and now you've got to pay another half a million dollars just to maintain this property. I would hardly call it a park. So let's say it's around 40 million. What I would like to propose is if, you, if the town actually votes this in, then my guess is we won't again, which is a shame. But if we did, what I would propose is that the $2 million of revenue that's generated from this property be earmarked to pay down this debt and for nothing else but the debt. It would take you 20 years, but then we would be a very attractive town and your ta our taxes would, at the very minimum, be stabilized, but perhaps go down. Tina Barabati, um, different perspective from what you've heard. I'm a business owner in the town. I also own a home in the town on Johnson Road, but I own a large parcel uh, that most of you know as Oak Lane, which is a golf course very close to the Woodbridge property. Um, if I had a portable business and not a business that was physically planted in the ground, I don't know that I could stay here, given the taxes. Um, so my question to you folks is, Specifically, the demographic that you hope to attract with these units are obviously potentially my customers, but what have you seen in your experience as to what that demographic can bring to the town in terms of income, uh, leisure time that can support new business? Because I think we disagree on a lot here tonight, but what we can agree on is that if we don't get business into this town and keep business into this town, our taxes will never come down. Um, so these are, from my perspective, like I said, potential customers because the age and relative income. But if you could speak to your experience as to what your communities have brought to the tax base outside of just specifically the property taxes that they're generating with their homes. I can't speak exactly to what Every uh, resident, particularly the Fieldstone Project, brings to Orange, which is where that one is located. But what I can tell you, my experience has been on that project as well as other age restricted, is it, it attracts, obviously, people who are of, of older age. Generally, these are folks who are buying their last home or they're selling their current home, which is often much larger, perhaps where they raised their family. Uh, frankly, a lot of people typically don't need mortgages, and they are both active in the their individual communities, and frankly, my experience is, on a general basis, they have some uh, ability to spend their resources where they live. Um, unlike first-time home buyers who are sort of stretching, skimping, and trying to save enough to buy a relatively small home, raise a family, uh, they're not going to do a whole lot more because they're starting off, as most people do, with relatively little means. Our experience is, is generally people are downsizing, a lot of people have homes in other states, maybe vacation homes, they're generally people of relative wealth, this is Woodbridge, this is going to attract a, what we believe to be a reasonably affluent um, class of individuals comparable to people who already live here. Generally speaking, we think they'll have resources to spend in the town and they are a good mix and they're a good act. Exactly what Carl said, uh, the only other thing I would add to it is that you know, one of the, the good things about a 55 and older community is that it's not a retirement community. These are, for the most part, um, husband and wife uh, that are still working. Uh, they're, they're, they haven't retired yet. They're going to go, be going out to dinners and, and playing golf and, and doing other things. And again, 
one of the things that I see with this, bringing a community like this, or a small development like this, into our community, I think gives us the opportunity to grow business. We, we don't have business in, in, this, in this town. Uh, there's maybe one strip mall down there, you know, by the tunnel. But I, I think it, with a, a revitalized sense of staying within town, uh, that we, we can generate more business. Maybe, maybe even bring uh, some new jobs into this town, which is desperately needed. And, and another reason why our taxes are high is because you know, there, there is no business. I mean, there's no business to, to take that, uh, that burden off of the residents itself. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Charles Griffin. I live in Woodbridge, Second Road. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on the fact that uh, I'm not sure this is the best way uh, to do this because I really only understood about two, one third of what anybody here has said tonight. I have old ears. I look back here and see a lot of other people with old ears. You know, there is a more modern way to do this. This is really old fashioned. Uh, not that this shouldn't be done uh, simultaneously, but the modern way to do this is to have a conversation online. Is to have a conversation online where everybody uh, goes online and the person, when they go online, they can read everybody else's comments also. The developers could put any comments on any uh, person's thing. That way you really get a clear idea of what people are saying. Uh, I, I swear to God, you know, it, you know, it's very difficult to understand anybody here uh, when you've got old ears and this is muffled. This is a bad sound system, it's muffled. So anyway, I would suggest in the future, even with this, that you have online a conversation which everybody comes up like this, puts a little bit in, puts a little bit, person can see it all the like. Also, the developers can put comments. Thank you. Okay, now to the subject at hand. Uh, I was 70 some years ago, the first time I lived in this town. I could walk from Seymour a, a Road to the town hall or, or the church without crossing a road. Uh, things have changed, obviously. The population probably has four times as much as it used to be. What you have in a situation is always, okay, we come a little more, open space, we come a little more, oh, just a little bit, then we come a little more, just a little bit. But every time you take something out, it's never coming back. Look down the road 100 years from now, 200 years from now. You don't want to be nothing, because if you teach, Generation cuts, and the next generation cuts, and the next generation cuts. There isn't going to be anything left. So we, we really do have to really be careful of what we do. Um, as far as the development in, in, in the town and the Broadway, there are other ways to save money also. This town spends from 100 to 200 percent more on police than comparable towns in, in Connecticut. I mean, I know that the, uh, the police commission are, are big on police, but we don't need to spend 100 to 200 percent more on police than other comparable towns. You know, and in these two projects here, they're very similar, but a little smaller than the previous one. They didn't seem to get the idea, maybe of using some land that's on wood fields, parkway side. Oh no, we've got to create the developers to do that. That's not open space that we want to really worry about. But that could be developed. And maybe just across the street from that, you can have some of the building. That's social compromise. You know, where people try to compromise. But anyway, I've had enough to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Liz Giacomino, 9 Fairview Road, Woodbridge. Um, I moved to this town 16 years ago. Uh, I knew I was not going to have children. However, I partially moved for the good school system, and I also moved to the open space. I was extremely proud of this town when it decided to purchase the property of the country club and not allow developers. People don't move to towns because they're looking for 55 places to live. 
They moved to towns because they had uniqueness. Woodbridge has that uniqueness now, and we have to be good stewards of the property that we own and keep it as a I'm sorry to continue to hear that the Board of uh, Selectmen continue to create the false equivalent of lower taxes versus open space. If we sell off the open space immediately to developers, the properties around that area will lose value. That, as you know, will then drop the property tax debt that come in from those existing properties. Uh, additionally, the development itself could risk many of our wells that are in the area due to potential needs for development uh, excuse me, d uh, dynamiting. Um, there's also environmental risks. There are streams that run through that property that run to the sound. So there's significant environmental risk that we have, not to mention the expenses of potentially needing additional first responders because we're having a new retirement community. I know they didn't call it that, but that's really who goes to those places. Um, some options for keeping it as an open space. In 2015, Woodridge Country Club was voted the best golf course in Connecticut through Travel and Leisure magazine. It has a unique design. We could also enhance that if we want to keep it as a golf course. I'm not a golfer. I'm not pro golf course or anti golf course. However, we can make it unique if we do keep it that way. What about an eco-friendly, organic type of golf course? Golf courses are notorious for their pesticides and weed killers. Why don't we encourage a new golf course that's, that's unique and organic? Open space options. Keeping groomed walking and running trails. Perhaps um, some cross-country skiing trails. Um, I would say that Wickham Park if any of you are familiar with Wickham Park in the central Connecticut area, is probably a good example of a park that, that could give us some guidance as to how that could be. Um, I would encourage the Board of Selectmen to not uh, go against the continued wishes of the voters uh, of this town and continue to, and, and I would encourage you to continue to keep it open space and please be good stewards of our land. We're only here for a little while. Thank you. Thank you. I could, I could respond on that one. Just for the record's clear. We're not aware, or I'm not aware, or our, our team is not aware of any instance where we put in an age restricted project that's driven property values down. In fact, in our orange project, if anybody's been there, there's Sunrise uh, Hill Circle, which runs really around our entire uh, uh, project. We've had new and used homes in that area. There are affluent homes similar to homes that are here in town. There's been no marketable decrease, and no one has contacted anybody indicating that that project has decreased property values. I think it's just a generalization that is probably untrue in general, and I think it's specifically untrue as to our experience as a development team. So I just don't think that statement has a lot of uh, relevance to what's going on. We don't see any environmental risks. There is no environmental contamination on the property that we're aware of. Generally, although obviously we haven't studied it, it's been a golf course for a long time. Um, we are not anticipating any blasting. I don't anticipate any problems with wells. Um, so uh, just so the record's clear, we think this is a minimal impact project, particularly where uh, Mr. Sachs' team has located it, as was described by Mr. Ott. There's no reason to believe that these wells located around the property are going to be impacted by that. It's going to be public uh, water and public sewer systems. There's not going to be any need to go well drilling. Uh, so I just want to make sure the record is clear. I understand everyone has their, their opinion, but for purposes of the record, I'll make sure that was clear. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martha German. I live at 1170 Johnson Road, which is the corner of Johnson and Antonio Road. I have four areas of question and then a statement which I would like to read. First, if the Board of Selectmen brings a proposal to a vote, will it be definitely by ballot? Are you talking about a referendum? Yes. Yes. And not a town hall vote? No. It will be a referendum. Will there be absentee ballots available for people who are away? Yes. Thank you. 
Mr. Chief, here. They have to apply for them. In, oh, in yes, so I see that. Absolutely. Well, we, sure. Of course we allow it. <laughs> now we vote. Mr. Chief, here. Your proposal underwent some major changes. Who was your former partner? My former partner was Clubhouse Capital. They were they're out of um, out of Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sorry, Rhode Island. And we we just felt that it was a better better fit with Phil uh, for this particular project to to bring him in rather than someone from from Rhode Island. Why was that? I just, as I mentioned, I believe Phil was a better fit as a as a partner for this project than than the other Clubhouse Capital um, partner. Mr. Sachs. Um, you have estimated five years to complete the project. If there is a recession, what would your estimated time frame be? It's really impossible for us to say what recession will bring or what a boom in the economy will bring. If the economy is better, it can go quicker. Of course, if the economy fails again, it will take longer time. Well, we don't have a crystal ball. No, excellent. No crystal ball. No. All right. Um, effects of traffic from residents of your homes have been minimized, but two major problems have not been addressed. First is the continual disruption of local traffic during those years of construction. Your developments will be accessed from Ansonia Road and from Johnson Road. Ansonia. State Road 243 is a major commuter artery to New Haven. Morning and evening, the flow of cars is constant. Traffic is also busy on Johnson Road, which serves as a commuter shortcut to Route 34. Tony, I've often seen you drive whizzing around the corner heading for Route 34. Um, friends familiar with housing developments warned me that trucks delivering construction materials will regularly snarl the local traffic. The disastrous effect of runoff from uphill construction has also been overlooked. Over decades of walking that course, I know the slope is always soggy. Your construction will decrease water absorption and funnel the flow directly toward Johnson Road and my house. The heavy rains this fall caused flooding over Ansonia Road. Cars had to turn around rather than drive through the intersection. The water left a tide line of leaves and branches on my front lawn. Construction will certainly increase flooding at this crossroad. These two points of concern, plus the effects of blasting on our wells, mounds of dirt, the construction mess and noise, and the destruction of this beautiful open space are all simply unacceptable. And I personally object to any entrance driveway across the street from my property. Now, for the Board of Selectmen, I would like to ask, how do you justify flushing my neighborhood literally and figuratively down the drain? Thank you. My name is Rich Kruger. I live on 24 Sunbrook. The first thing I'd like to say is congratulations to the people at Woodbridge. I think your turn was a good turnout, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm in favor of it, or I'm saying I'm opposed, but it's nice to see so many people <coughs> here the voice their opinion. The only thing I have to say, we're talking about age 55 and older. As I look through the room, there's not too many people that are under 55. So good luck and good luck to the select. We are here. Thank you. My name is Kathy Wick. I live on Raymond Road. Kathy Wick. I live on Raymond Road. First, I wanted to um, clarify some of the numbers that are being thrown around tonight. Um, the debt, current debt on Country Club, Tony, I believe, is approximately four hundred thousand per year. So exactly what it is. Okay. So the current, currently, we owe four point five five million dollars. Right. We have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar pay down requirement in August, so that will bring 
the um, uh, debt down to four point two million dollars, which is what we'll owe after the notes are matured. In terms of debt service, uh, our current debt service in the um, current budget is four hundred fifty-eight thousand. That fluctuates every year because we issue notes. So as the market changes, so does our debt service. If I take what I anticipate, we have to lock in these uh, notes to long-term debt probably next summer. Based on where the current rates are, uh, our average over the remainder of the term, which is to 2031, is about 430,000. So it'll start high and then it's low because as you're okay. Yeah. So and then the carrying costs are anywhere between with utilities and all this. $50,000, dollars roughly. Okay. So the debt service costs us, in, as an individual, me personally, when you divide it, that number by 10,000 residents of the town, 40 bucks a year. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's per capita. Right. right, 40 right. bucks per capita a year, right. per, per person per year, is what the debt on this property costs so, us. And yeah. that's going to end in 10, 12 years, you said? In uh, 2031. So uh, the, if, if you look at it in terms of uh, the average um, assessed value of a house, which is um, about a three hundred thousand dollar assessment, which is a four hundred and fifty. Right, and it's about a half a mil per household. Well, yeah, it's, right. It's, right that's I'm trying to get a sense of what it is per person per year, and it's a, in the neighborhood of forty dollars per person. It's, about person a, it's a half a mil. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so. That's not a very big number to keep this property from being developed. It's not actually costing us, when you think about it, per year, it's a tank of gas, it's two large pizzas. Okay? Um, so I just wanted to get that out there so people have some context for what the, the numbers that we're talking about. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is zoning in general. What is the purpose of zoning? Why do we have it? We have zoning to give purchasers of property some reasonable assurance about what can and cannot happen in their neighborhoods. First thing I did 20 some years ago when I was considering <coughs> living in Woodbridge is after looking at a property that I liked, I went to town hall and I talked to the zoning enforcement officer, found out about the zoning in town, what different zones there were, what were the regulations, Etc. What were the restrictions on various properties that were near my property? So, when people purchase a home near a golf course, it's not reasonable for them to assume that it will always be a golf course because things change. But it is reasonable for them to assume that it can't be any worse than what's allowed in the zoning. And in the case of the country club property, what was allowed is single family homes on eight and a half lots. So, zoning regulations, I think, are an implied contract between the town and its residents. An assurance that their quality of life and their property value will not be destroyed by a neighbor being allowed to construct a shopping mall, a factory, or a condominium complex. Town officials in Orange, where the Fieldstone project uh, resides, do seem to respect this principle. Um, I was interested to note that this past summer, there was a 40 unit, over 55 development proposed in Orange in its residential zone. Uh, Fieldstone and the other dense developments in Orange are not in residential zones, such as the Country Club Zone. Uh, Fieldstone is on Route 34, which is a divided highway. Uh, it's a couple hundred feet from big box stores. Uh, it's not the same kind of area that we're talking about at the Country Club. Uh, there are other dense developments in Orange, but they're in the commercial and the industrial areas. They're not in residential zones. So, the TPZ in Orange turned down this relatively small development, it was only 40 units in a residential area, and they turned it down unanimously, and the rationale was very interesting to me. They said what was the deciding factor was homeowners' expectations when they moved to Orange. And this is a quote from the TPZ chair. They relied on that acre and a half zoning, and a reasonable expectation is that that is going to stay that way, he said. A project like this can be done in town because the regulations provide for it in other places. Just like in Woodbridge, we do have areas where this type of density is permitted. Just not there in a residential zone. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? 
My name is Julie Glitzman. I live on Johnson Road. I'm a neighbor of the Country Club and the Woodbridge Center director. I also serve as the Library Commission Chair. I'd like to speak tonight for those not in the room. The truth is, you don't often see, I know you're all above 55, but senior seniors in this room. So there aren't a lot of seniors in this room at evening meetings. They don't come out so often. Their voices are not heard. I'm going to have to speak in generalities here, but for the most part, many seniors in town live on fixed incomes. It's safe to say that as long as we own money on the Woodbridge Country Club pro Woodbridge Club pro property, our taxes will not be going down. It's also safe to say that services provided by the town are as limited as each department's budget, which is being frozen or decreased. The Woodbridge Center is 40 years old, and it looks it. The center provides much needed socialization opportunities for seniors, as well as health and wellness education, fitness, nutrition, and transportation. As the center ages and becomes more and more run down, we need the funds to redesign for better functionality and to better provide services. In other words, we need the tools to get our job accomplished. The sale of the country club would not only relieve the town's debt, but provide the much needed revenue to the grand list for future needs in all of the town's departments. We hope you consider relieving the town's debt and supporting one of these two projects. Thank you. My name is Susan Davidson. I reside at 15 Edge Hill Drive here in Woodridge. I have one brief statement. As a resident of Woodridge for 47 years, I enthusiastically support the idea of 55 and over housing on the Country Club of Woodridge property. Currently, 35% of our population in Woodridge is 55 and over, and the time has come for senior housing. I thank the Board of Selectmen for pursuing this option, and I think I have heard that almost 20 people, 20 former residents of Woodbridge now reside in Orange. And so I think that one could actually argue that the time is long overdue. Well, my name is Paul Eric, and I live at 27 Brook Road. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker who was just up to point out the fact that if you're interested in 55 and over housing, you can move to Orange. Um, uh, I don't understand why we still have the same proposals continually being brought up at these town meetings. This is the third time uh, almost identical proposals that have been uh, put before the town. I don't think uh, the development is in keeping with the town whatsoever, and I'm not in favor of it. Um, I'd also like to point something out to the developers, that this proposal that you're, that, you're, that you're putting forward now has been rejected twice. If you have a lot of time and money to spend on this, go for it, because I intend to go out door to door with a lot of other people in the community to get people to vote against this. I'm Tim Chequedin from Or Woodfield Road. Um, why the plan to sell now? The land is increasing in value every year. The town of Woodbridge intervened at the right time and bought the land for $6.9 million. Thanks to the interest rates being low, no, and the proper handling of the situation by the Board of Selectmen and the Woodbridge Finance Department. We now have an asset that is, is worth more than we paid for it. We should not sell the former country club. <laughs> No, no. Uh, uh, we can we can just have discussions together. No, no. Uh, for, to be clear with what the date is, uh, 
Tony, you will have cl clarified that. But uh, the, the per percentage of per capita income is uh, 3.90%. The percentage of per capita income. Are you doing a, a debt percentage? Yeah. Of debt per capita? Yeah. yeah. Is 3.91%. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Ellen Scalatar. I live at 1265 Racebrook Road. Um, I think if the property is sold, the first thing to do is buy a new sound system. <laughs> I want to thank you all for the, both proposals. I think they're both excellent proposals. And thank the board very much for bringing them before us. Um, it's been said tonight that these are proposals we've seen before, and it's also been said that we can do better. And I think when you put these two concepts together, the fact is we can't do better. This is the sweet spot for the town of Woodbridge and the Country Club property. You've talked about the resident benefits. You both laid them out very well. There is no perfect answer to this, but this provides so much relief to the town of Woodbridge. When we talk about housing values, the biggest concern in Woodbridge is the mill rate that keeps our house prices down. And the one avenue we have to make a difference in this town is to do something with the Country Club of Woodbridge property. That's not to say we shouldn't be looking at economic development and different changes, but those are very, very difficult. We've put years into them. And it's really time for us to make a change at the Country Club. Other towns do over 55 housing, and they're delighted with it. They're wealthy towns. They're middle-income towns. They are shocked that the town of Woodbridge would reject these proposals over and over again. So what I would ask the Board of Selectmen is to choose uh, between these two proposals. I think they're both excellent. They're fine points that I know you'll have to work out. And let the people really decide. It will be a different turnout for a referendum than it is for this kind of meeting. And then we'll know truly if the town wants to do something about its millery and its values. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joanna Rodriguez, 10 Old Prairie Road. I've been living in Woodbridge for six years. I've been raising my kids here. And I have more general questions to address. Such what I understand. <laughs> well, what people said, they were saying that it was going to take five years to make the economic benefit back. Once you purchase a property, are you going to be paying taxes while you're developing the property? Yeah. Yes. Taxes are paid as we go. Because like they were saying that the tax benefit that you be receiving is not going to take it back for you know five to six years if the economy slows down. I'm like, if the economy slows down, and you you know, stop the production on the career development. I want to make sure somebody's going to continue paying their taxes. It's not just a complete hold, hey, we're not developing, we're not. Which, whichever developer, if one were chosen, once the town sells the property to a private entity, it goes back on the tax rolls. So it's going to come off the town tax free, like this building, and it's going to go on. Um, and to, to further your question, I did some quick math, I'm sure other people did. If you build out a project of 125 units and you average about $2 million a year in taxes, you're looking at about $22 million in annual tax increase to the town, net revenue, okay. for those of you doing the math. Now, how much are these properties going to be selling for, you know, for the residents? Because, Freddie, if you think about all the homes, I know somebody mentioned about during the summer, all the houses that go up for sale. I've been seeing a lot more and more people moving in with younger children. I know we moved in not knowing we were going to have kids and learn to I have two already. And, you know, and you see everybody just growing. And, you know, I know some people talk about it, talk about the property, senior citizens moving there, but then you might have a higher supply of property. And maybe that's if the demand's not there, maybe the value is going to go down. So I'm just I think curious, the residential, like how much is it going to go for? Well, I think both proposals, and Brad can speak himself, but both proposals have a wide range. They're going to be starting in the floors, and you can double that number depending on how big you want it and what you want to put in it. There'll be a very broad range. I, I got to think this for both projects. These are largely customized homes. Um, they're not cookie cutter. Um, you know, they'll probably have a minimum footprint size, but if somebody wanted to. Uh, finish the downstairs, somebody wants to finish the walk. 
uh, one car garage, two car garage, we envision a large variance. So if you have people who are modest means, they want a house in the 450s, somebody wants one worth 900,000, we expect to be able to build across the spectrum. And I think Brian would say the same. So well, who's your demographic? Who are you going out to sell? Is, I, is it here in Connecticut? Are you going to like New York, New Jersey, trying to bring them in? I think about people 55 and older, they're going to want the warmer weather and be able to enjoy, you know, a longer season than, you know. Our experience in Orange is a wide range of people, a number of people from Woodbridge. Um, I grew up in Hampton, I live in Hampton, I know a lot of people who live in the area. Um, I've done all the closings for that project and I can tell you there's certainly Woodbridge residents that have moved to Orange, move into the Fieldstone project. We've had people from out of state, we have people who move from Fairfield County, um, a lot of people who have downsized, people who had families, three and four kids, had a large home, four or five bedrooms, their kids are now out of the home, they don't need 5,000 square feet, they're moving into 2,200 square feet, maintenance free living, no grass to cut, no snow to plow, we see a wide range of people, including people who have homes in the, the Carolinas, people who have homes in Florida, but a lot of people who stay here all winter as well, they're, uh, they're here to be very dedicated to their communities, we find that people in, in these communities have time to be involved, unlike just a regular condominium kind of project with, uh, say, people in their 30s and 40s who are working hard every day, they're tired at night. These properties, in particular, ones with the community areas uh, that both proposals have. Uh, our Fieldstone project has an annual system in the Sunday brunches. They've been doing Sunday brunch at Fieldstone since we built it 10 years ago. And we put up the clubhouse like the first year. There has been a core group of people that host people who are interested in prospective housing. They have their own core group of people, a card, uh, people play cards. These are really active communities. These are not retirement communities. These people don't go here um, on their last leg. Uh, they are not consumers of large amount of public resources. These are really self-sufficient, self independent living communities. They're, they're nicely and well regulated by people who typically care a lot about them. They're, they're, they have a significant investment in these homes. These are not on the whole cheap. Uh, we expect the average price seem to be six fifty, seven hundred thousand. People who call that much money into a home are going to care about it. They're going to care about their community, uh, and they typically take a very active role. In it. Yeah, just just to reiterate on that, and and I agree with everything he said. Um, the, mainly the to, to answer your question about the target audience, for the most part, from what I've I've in my research, and I've actually spoke with several 55 million communities in the area to, to get some feedback from them. Their demographics are mainly from the state of Connecticut. They, the, the, the people who come into these communities, one of two things. They're, they either have family in the area, you know, they're, they're retired, they have family in the area, grandkids that they don't want to leave. Uh, two, that they really you know love the area, love the state of Connecticut. Um, and I can, one, speak from experience. My, my in-laws live at Oxford Greens, which is a 55 and older community. And they had a 3,500 square foot house with three girls that when they got to 65 years old, they said, you know, hey, listen, I can't take care of this huge house and this acre and a half that we have that we need to down, downsize. And they live there uh, 10, you know, 10 months out of the year, and the, rest of the other two months they rent a house in Florida. So that, that's sort of the demographics. You're going to get mainly Connecticut people uh, to move into these, even though heck, I would love New York people you know, to, to come to our, our state. But it, it's mainly going to be local residents that you know, love, love the area, want to stay close to family, and, and they can do their retirement in the wintertime, you know, the, the two months in the Florida. Now, my final question was, you both talked about the common area, the community, open space, renovating the pool. When is that going to be done the phase? Is it going to be done at the beginning of the phase, middle of the phase? Like, when are you going to be basically putting back into the community? So you're buying the property, you're going to build into it. But when is the renovation for the public? Sure, I, I can speak for, for my proposal and I'll let Carl speak for his. Um, the, the pool would be one of the first things that we do. Uh, in terms of the town park, that, that still needs to be talked through with the town, um, whether it starts in the beginning or, or during the duration of it. But the pool itself, that one of our, while we're in there with, all, with our machines, you know, um, doing demo work, the, the, the clubhouse will come down and we'll put down, we'll put up the new clubhouse and renovate the pool. So that, that would be something I'd be looking, I mean, my family used to go to, my, I mean, we went to the pool, uh, we use it. So, you know, it's something that I would want to get up and running as soon as possible. And I'll let Carl. 
we have to grind uh, timeline. It, it'll be early, as will our clubhouse for the project itself, but we anticipate doing the what we call off-site work for the town on the front end as well. Okay, right, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Queen Miller. I live in 21 Brookwood Drive, and I've been here five years. Um, I, I'm not into, I don't have any questions for so, uh, you guys, because I'm not interested in any particular. Uh, five years ago, I moved over here because I like Woodbridge. It's quiet, I have space. Uh, you know, nature and stuff. Uh, that's why I moved here. And now you plan to put a lot of houses, and now like when I walk out of my house and I see so many houses over there, if I knew that you're going to do this, I wouldn't move to Woodbridge. And if you build this one, I probably will move out of Woodbridge in a couple of years. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Cooper and I live on Ford Road. Actually, this is a project whose time has come. In fact, when this started five or six years ago, I was not elderly, but I am now. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, so let me tell you, I've been selling real estate in this town for 42 years. I've seen a lot, and a lot has changed. The town, the town needs to keep up with what younger families are looking for. And unfortunately, we're a town that has beautiful bucolic scenery, but we're missing things that young families are looking for. Building this project would help some of the older families or older people move in to one of these projects and make room for younger families who can come in. The housing market has taken a real dive, and Woodbridge is one of the towns that's been hit the hardest. So five, six years ago, the medium income was about five and a quarter, not the median income, the median price range was five and a quarter, with taxes of about $8,000. The, the medium house price now is three fifty, dollars with taxes between ten dollars and $12,000. We're losing a lot of people because of the taxes. We don't have a town center right now. We don't have any place for young families to take their baby carriages, park, and go have coffee with some friends. We're not between the Route, route 15 and I-95. We're missing what the younger people, and, and the f young families that are coming both work. The Woodbridge Country Club, Jet said, is over. That was over a long time ago. So the families that are coming here both work. They're looking for a good school system, which we certainly have. But they're also looking to connect. And without sidewalks and without some of these other things, we need to realize that we need to make Woodbridge more competitive in what we have to offer families that, that come here. So I think as much as, I mean, I've lived here forever. It feels like that. <laughs> Originally from Brooklyn, New York, as you might have guessed. But um, it's this, this project has, has, not, has got to move forward. We're, we're going to be left behind. And um, I just feel strongly that for the town, for all of us in the town, the, the burden of taxes is 95% on the residents. We have no commercial tax base in this town. And we just, you know, it's not to put anything down, but that's what we have to deal with. And the buyers can go wherever they want to. So thank you. Bill 68, Corn Hill Road. I'm going to speak as a resident, but then I'm also going to ask some questions in relation to the, uh, the pool and the clubhouse as the uh, vice chair of the uh, Recreation Commission. So 
So my first question, uh, you guys might want to jot these questions up. This is a number of them. Uh, I'm going to ask a series of answers, okay? First of all, I'd like each of you to both restate what your price offer was. The second thing I'd like you to do is that I would like you to indicate how much cash you're putting into the deal that's not financed, and how much actually is going to be the debt that's going to be financed, and under what terms you have that financing. If you need me to ask the question again, if you're going to answer out, I'll be happy to do that. The key is price, how much cash are you putting into the deal, how much is being financed over what period of time, what are the terms, okay? Because that has a big part in the whole questions that were asked about the proposal there. Um, I know, and next question would be, in terms of any liabilities, there are a couple other things, so just jot it down. I know my two minutes will be up quick. Uh, any liabilities in terms of any environmental cleanup on the property? I'm assuming, just confirm yes or no, that you're assuming any liability where whatever on the property is that you sit here by. Uh, and my comment over to the Board of Selectmen is, and one of the things I've come to realization as a resident, and I've kind of tried to explain this to my wife, uh, it looks like Woodbridge is probably going to be a little longer haul for us than probably putting us our, our balloons a few years ago because um, we're thinking kind of the equity we're going to get out of the house is by trimming expenses and paying off our mortgage versus kind of what we used to see with uh, the growth of the, the value of the home. And I, I urge you as you go through the budgets this year to look at every single, from the ground up, what does every person need the department do rather than just assuming just because we've had it, we can you having it so that way maybe we can go a little tighter on our spending and yes i say that and yep i'm involved with the recreation commission and today we looked at a budget to make that is zero so all right so i'll switch hats here just for a second and i the other questions for you are this the amount of dollars that each of you is going to commit to the recreational portion of the investment okay now, Greg, you know me from baseball. I'm still on the board. My kids long gone. I'm still involved with soccer. Still involved with the scouts. Still helping. Okay. The dollars that you're going to commit, the combination of redoing the pool, you put a new pool in, refurbishing the pool. How big is the clubhouse? Are there going to be showers? Clubhouse, sack bar, about the size, and the amount of dollars you're going to put into that because that's going to be helpful because people are going to be asking. Uh, us that. That's it. Those are my questions. You got all my questions? Okay, great. So our offer was for five point four million for the property. Um, as far as equity or cash in as you asked, it's gonna be somewhere between twenty five and thirty percent of the total development cost. If we estimate you know, 25 to 35 million dollars, I know that's a big swing, so pick 30 million as your average. Yep. Our, our cash in the deal will be 25 to 30 percent of that total amount. Um, yeah, and then in terms of uh, assuming responsibility for the pool, uh, it, yes, it's our understanding that if we own the property, we, you know, we're going to be renovating the pool on our own dollar. You know, putting the uh, you know the pool house up. That not not only would the revenue come to us, but we would also research, uh, you know assume the responsibility for the for the pool. Okay. You know, so the insurance would be under us, not not the town of Long term, you're going to be responsible. Long long term, yes, correct. Okay. That that's my offer. My my I can't speak okay, for for Carl, but mine is is that. And how big is the pool house? Uh, well, the, you, you mean the pool house or? Yeah, the pool house. I mean, if whatever it needs to be in terms for to, to accommodate the the uh, locker rooms and showers, call it two thousand square feet. It, it had the most. I mean, it's it's just it, you know it has to house the snack bar and, and things like that. Also, so maintain the pool ongoing is a big factor in your proposal. Yes, thank you. We're still evaluating most of our figures. There's, there's an awful lot of moving parts here. Uh, location of the project itself. Um, Brian's proposal has in one area, we have it in another. Uh, there's some significant variance in our opinion regarding the construction costs, depending on where the town ultimately wants it put. So at this point, we're still looking at our final price. Uh, we've had some discussions with the selectmen, but 
we're not prepared to put a final number on it until we have more definitive idea of what it's going to cost us to build it and where we're going to put it. Uh, financing, uh, I'll echo Phil's position. That's standard financing in the industry was consistent with what we've done in other projects. Uh, we, do use, we do intend to use bank financing. The bank's going to want a solid 20 25% of the developer money in the deal. That's pretty standard. We wouldn't expect to ask for anything unusual there. Uh, at this point, no one, at least no one on our team, has done any environmental uh, assessments of the property. We would have no idea what environmental impacts exist, if any. Uh, it's been a golf course for as long as, for, as long as I have been aware as a Connecticut resident. Uh, but until somebody identifies whether there's an environmental problem and then what it would cost to treat it, it's a little hard to just say, sure, we got it. Um, the pool will be appropriately sized. We're envisioning a new pool, not a refurbishment of the existing pool with the commensurate and appropriate size changing facility um, to get to be worked out with the town. The, the, those details are still, you know, really up in the air. I'm sure it'll be part of the planning zoning process. Where it goes, how big is it, how big is the parking do, do we need? There's a lot of factors that go into that as well. Okay, thank you. My name is Pat Taylor. I'm yeah, here. Can you speak up, please? Okay, yeah. I'm, my name is Pat Taylor, and I live in 63 Newton Road. I've been a resident of Newton Beach since 1979. And I walked that property And I will tell you, I have walked it in the morning, I've walked it in the evening. In the evening, and I must say that to let that property go and not to preserve that property as open space for future generations is a crime. <laughs> I, it is breathtakingly beautiful. I also walk the trails of Woodbridge, there is nothing to compare to the sunsets at Woodbridge Country Club on the top of the hill. In addition, the plantings on that property, the trees, the bushes, are spectacular. What will happen to some of those old trees in that landscape? How expensive could it be for Woodbridge to have a Woodbridge Preserve for future generations, not only our generation, but future generations, you cannot put a price on that property. You cannot. I have traveled out west. My husband's a mountain climber, he's 71 years old. It's just such a wonderful, extraordinary uh, uh, opportunity for which to take. And I want to be on record to say that land should be preserved for not only us, but the future. How expensive would it be to put in the walking trails? There's lots of trails there as well. Yeah. To put in stone trails. To mow the lawn. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to preserve that land. I have been here since 1979. Taxes never go down. And to oppose 400,000 houses for senior citizens. I don't know. That's, I just had to say that because that land is breathtakingly beautiful. It was also part of preserving <coughs> the Woodbridge uh, Fitzgerald property, and I walked that, of course, many times. And it doesn't compare in grandeur or stature to that land. Please don't let it go for future generations as well. That's all I want to say. I don't know some facts and statistics about it. I just know taxes never go down. <laughs> Thank you. Um, after 9 o'clock, we still have another meeting after this, believe it or not. I guess if you have signed in, we'll kind of limit it. Just three more people to speak? Okay. Okay. So we'll end with Joyce, your last one. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Dick. Hi, my name is Derek Gable. I've lived in the area since uh, 2002. Uh, most of it in uh, Westville up the street, but I've been in Woodbridge uh, for about the last three years. Um, my family actually grew up in Maine. Uh, my parents and, and much of my family is still up there. And uh, so I'm not a stranger to very passionate environmental and open space issues and arguments. <laughs> um, 
But I think that one of the things that we've learned in Maine is that there's a, there's a way to both preserve space and, and make it usable for, for the benefit of everybody. Um, my, one of my friends owns about 126 acres up in Columbia Falls, which is a ways up there by Machias. And um, he, out of the 126 acres, he is only allowed to use 50 of it because it's in an easement with the, with the Salmon Society. Um, because a lot of it's on the Pleasant River. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the options that's, that people have taken up there, um, which protects it. It's in a, a 50 year easement, and, and nothing can happen to it, even though he technically owns the property. Um, just, a, just an idea um, that, that, that may be an option down the road. But I also want to, in full disclosure, I, I live in, in the neighborhood of, of, of Brian's neighborhood. Um, and over the last two years, I've kind of pestered him about the project to see what was going on. Um, and just out of interest, I think the original proposal involved renovating the golf course. So I was trying to get into golf and was, was extra interested there. But um, I think that uh, you know one of the things that struck me in talking to him early early on was his passion for the town of Woodbridge and, and what was uh, worried about what was best for the town long term. Um, and so I think that uh, this is the first time I've heard any of the proposals in full. Um, and I just think that uh, with the option to keep uh, a secluded 55% over community in addition to having the park um, or at least develop that, that and keep that open space is would be really important long term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Decision. 
and then you know maybe address whether home values would be impacted. But really, what I'm going towards is um, we can look at this as residents as uh, a value proposition, right? When we look at the net positive and negative impacts compared to you know doing nothing with the property, the carrying cost, holding it as a park. Do we want to pay $50 a year? Do we want to pay $300 a year in opportunity cost to not do anything? Or do we want the benefits, including intangibles, uh, reinvigoration of the community, new people, right? There's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of things you can't quantify, but as a resident, as an engineer, uh, I would request that we quantify as much as we can. So I would ask developers to work with the town and board selectmen to provide as much information so we can make a good decision. I think it would be helpful if you could give me that in an email, all of those questions, so we can make sure. I'm not sure some of the data is available, but as much as we can get, that would be helpful if you give it to us. It'd be great. Not, not the data, but the questions, so we can get the data to the residents. We have to help. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. I'm Joyce Snard, and I live uh, at 106 Peck Hill Road at Woodbridge. Um, I, what I'm going to say, I hope I am speaking not just for myself, but for other people in my age range. I first moved into Woodbridge in about 35 years ago, and I liked the town very much. And as time went on, I came to love it more and more. I love the culture, I love the environment, I love the animal life I see out my window every day. Um, but as time's gone by, it seems that my house has gotten larger, and my land has gotten bigger. And I realize that, my husband and I have come to realize that it's time, time to downsize. But right now, we have no place to downsize to. If we are hoping that one of these proposals is accepted, but if they're not, we're going to have to move on to Woodland, and I'm not happy with that idea at all because I really, really love this town. And I think there are a lot of other people like me who don't. question to people who are, well, to the town in general. If you are against this idea of 55 plus community, what are you really afraid of? Thank you. Thank you. from everyone and as, if you couldn't make it tonight and you see this on TV, please send me an email if you have questions. Um, we have another item on the agenda. I'll keep talking even though everybody is leaving. Um, it's item number four. The Board of Select will, will again discuss negotiations regarding proposals for the town's own former country club. When we conclude our executive session and return to public session, please note but this is a special meeting, and we do not have an action item listed on our agenda, and there will be no vote this evening. I may, however, have some additional information to share regarding next steps. If so, I will have that added to the website, and it will go out by email. We will continue to keep the public informed. I will now entertain a motion pursuant to Section 1 200 6 and friends, friend B, and friends, to move into executive session. Invite attorney Weiner and finance director Genevieve to join us in executive session. Is there a second?